stands for xenotropic murine retrovirus. Murine means from the mouse, not that, we've caught, not that people have caught it off a mouse, but it's a, a virus that's very common in mice, and that's where it's first isolated. Uh, and retrovirus is a particular way that that virus behaves, and it's one of the family of which the HIV AIDS virus belongs, but it's nothing like AIDS. It's a totally different virus. It's important to understand that. Whoops, I'm there. Yeah. So just to quickly tell you what we've covered in London, and this is very, very quick because there was a huge lot of research, but Jonathan Kerr in London found I mean, he's, he's talked before about seven subcategories of chronic fatigue syndrome according to the genes. They have identified the genes that are prominent in this illness, and he had seven categories. He now has eight, and he's ident identified it very definitely. Um, and those eight subcategories each has a different set of symptoms, and the symptoms sort of tie in with the genetic profile. The sad news is that Jonathan Kerr's research is not going to continue because there's no more funding, and he's moving on out of the whole chronic fatigue syndrome arena, which is very, very sad because he's been one of the leading researchers we've had. Um, Nancy Climas, who is coming out here at the end of the year, gave us a brilliant talk on the different immune parameters. They've identified many, many changes in the immune system which are identifiable on um, blood tests, and some of which are very, very specific to this illness. But like a lot of the immune system tests, unless you're sitting there in a dedicated laboratory such as hers, the test is useless. It's got to be blood has to be looked at almost straight away, but they were particularly interested now in a, an enzyme called neuropeptide Y, which they find is certainly very abnormal in CFS patients, and so far these abnormalities have not been found in other diseases. So that has great, great promise as being the test of the future for people with this illness. So I think the good news in CFS and XMRV now is that the researchers are very firmly getting together and collaborating. They're not working away silently in their own laboratory, keeping everything secret. They're really being very open, and that's wonderful news because that doesn't often happen in research. But I'm just mentioning here a few of the studies that were presented at this American meeting. And if you've got access to the internet, you can go on the internet and find out all this stuff. It's all there um, in great detail, which is beyond people like me. But anyway, you know, virologists and biochemists and people do talk a totally different language. Um, but the first study that's been as near as possible to a replication of the Mikovits study in Reno that first talked about this XMRV was the one by um, person below and Tony Comoff and Mona Grauta, and they detected what they call an MLB-like virus. Now, that's a mouse leukemia virus, but it's part of the same family as XMRV. They're all sort of linked in these viruses. It's like, you know, very close relations. It's not necessarily a virus that causes leukemia, but it's of that family. So not all leukemia viruses cause leukemia. But they detected that virus in 82% of CFS patients in their near on now replication study of the other one, and only in 7% of controls, which were pretty similar to that first positive set that I talked of. So we have to ask ourselves, well, what will we act with it? What's going on? Where's it going? And I think we have to say, well, what does it mean, first of all? We found the virus in lots of people, in some studies, not in others. Now, it may be the actual cause of the illness. It may be that when you get, let's say, a glandular fever or whatever else sets off your illness, you happen to get the XMRV as well. And it may be the thing that makes you then have that prolonged illness. It may be an inherited virus, which comes down as that other one I mentioned a little while ago, comes down through the generations. Um, it may be a virus that you acquire at some time in your life, 
And because of your genetic profile, which we now know does exist, there's a genetic profile of people with this illness, perhaps you can't handle it or you carry on with it, and it sets the scene for future infection. So you might acquire it when you're crawling around the floor on a toddler, as a toddler, and then it sits in your system, and then later on you perhaps get glandular fever or some other bug, and the virus, the, the XMRV just happens to be there and it makes you more prone, it maybe damages your immune system in some way. And that's what we mean by a secondary infect. There may have been acquisition of the virus at some time earlier in your life. It may have only been a mild infection, it may not have even been an infection, it might not have caused any illness, but it damages your immune system in some way because you again inherited the genetic profile and the immune system is then damaged in such a way that it handles other infections later on incorrectly and then perhaps remains hyper switched on or hyper vigilant leading into CFS. Um, there may be, it may be just contamination in the laboratory, it may not be relevant at all, they may be picking it up because of some sort of contaminant, but bear in mind they didn't pick it up very often in the control population. Um, so whether there was some other sort of contamination that specifically was, uh, I think that sounds unlikely, quite honestly. Um, the other thing to say is it may be one of many viruses. They've only found this one in this particular lot of studies, but it may be one of a whole family of viruses, and those viruses may be present as well, and we don't yet know, and they will no doubt keep looking. Um, we just don't know. It may be implicated in lots of diseases. They know for sure, yes, it may be implicated in prostate cancer, maybe in some of the other cancers. We just don't know. Um, it may be a total red herring. It may be that people with CFS do carry it more readily than non-CFS people, but it may not actually cause any symptoms. It may not in any way be implicated in the actual illness. So those are some of the ways of looking at it. Then you've got to look at what the implications might be for the future. They certainly need more studies, and they need to be studies that as near as possible replicate the really good studies that have picked it up, and that will then validate the findings. And that needs to be done in different parts of the world because it may turn out to only be present in America or certain parts of Britain. It may not be here, but it might be here even more so. We just don't know. So it's got to be looked at everywhere, and I know for sure that Japanese and Chinese are looking. The next thing will be to find a cheap, easy, reliable test, because at the moment, this test can only be done in these very dedicated laboratories with this huge financial input and time input, and you've got to have absolutely well-qualified, well-trained researchers. It's not just something every other laboratory can do. So that's how they worked with the early days of AIDS research. And now, of course, any one of us can go along and get an HIV test done tomorrow and get a result two days later. So that's what they've got to work towards. And that's probably eventually what hopefully will happen if you can go and get a very easy test done. But it may well take time. And certainly, um, it's not going to be something that's going to be available like next week. So there's no point going asking for it yet. There are laboratories out there offering this test at quite high expense, but I couldn't honestly recommend the reliability at this stage. I think it's not worth spending the money. Um, then we talk about the next level, which would be, okay, let's suppose we find that the bug is valid and important, and then we've got a cheap, easy test to detect it. What about anti antiretroviral drugs? And there are a lot around, many, many, and they are used, of course, to treat AIDS or control AIDS. And many, many drugs were looked at and trialed. Many of them were found to be useless in AIDS, so they've been shelved. Um, I mean, don't mean they're sitting on the shelves going off or anything like that, but the, the knowledge has been shelved. And the potential is that there are a huge number of antiretroviral drugs out there which can be trialled in an illness such as this. Um, now, that does take a while because they've got to be shown to be reliable and they've got to be found to work. 
Um, no good taking something if it doesn't work. They've got to be shown to be safe, because no point in us giving it to all of you and killing you off. The only okay for giving us a nice bequest, but I mean, it's not really the answer at the end of the day. Uh, we want to keep our patients alive. And also, we don't know how long these drugs might need to be used for. Um, they might be something that the virus could be destroyed in three months of use. On the other hand, it might mean a lifetime of taking a drug to keep it under control, much as in HIV. Um, then, of course, once the drug has been trialled and proven to work and be shown to be safe, um, the drug has to be registered in different, well, different countries everywhere um, as suitable for this condition. And because these drugs are very, very expensive, they have to be registered in such a way that doctors can only prescribe them for set conditions because otherwise a lot of money might go down the drain. And at the moment, the antiretroviral drugs here are only available on prescription by uh, specialist infectious diseases physicians. Um, and they have to be only for HIV. Well, there are other antiviral drugs, of course, for other viruses, but they're very, very controlled into who can prescribe. Um, so they have to be registered and registered for that specific illness. And over time, of course, well, we hope the costs will decrease. There's a genetic vulnerability. We know the majority of people will have some sort of physical or emotional distress on their body in the lead up to the illness. There's almost always a viral illness, and this combination leads to immune changes, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, and it's those changes, this very overactive immune system that going on will cause the ongoing symptoms. Those symptoms are due to large quantities of cytokines circulating which alter the muscle chemistry, the brain chemistry, and the stomach chemistry, and so on. Um, bottom line for management, back to basics, we don't go rushing the antiretroviral drugs and have any finish now. Quickly go through accurate diagnosis, number one, top of the list, absolutely essential. Otherwise, we're treating things possibly incorrectly or inadequately. Stress management, very, no particular order for these things. But stress management and gentle exercise, rest and breathing, all good, sensible stuff, never overdoing it. Sensible, good quality diet, eat little and often have plenty of salt. Um, unless you've got high blood pressure. Um, supplements may or may not be suitable. You have supplements if you've got a proven deficiency in your bloodstream or anything, or if your diet's sadly lacking in anything. Otherwise, most supplements are not going to do very much for you, except possibly only through fish oil. There's good research to support that, and possibly B12 injections. Again, there's some research out there for that. Sleep are very high on the agenda if you can get good sleep, which almost always will need medication of some sort, such as the low dose tricyclics. Once you get good sleep, then you're much more likely to make a, some sort of improvement anyway, that enhance your chances of recovery. Relief from pain is obviously huge relief from stress and likely improvement in sleep and likely improvement in ability to exercise and so on. So good pain relief is really important and it might need to be spend a long time working towards that with combinations of approaches, which may be some sort of natural physical approaches or it may be drug orientated. And then they found that if you treat other symptoms properly, the person stands a much, much better chance of improving quality of life and enhancement of recovery. Um, so that's the way to go. Be like the tortoise you might get there in the end. Rush and tear and burn and crash where you're keep relapsing and you're, you know, not doing yourself a very good favour. So I'd better sleep, stop, because I've talked for a lot longer than I should have done, I'm sure. <laughs>